I would like to invite Mr. Vikram Vedinathan, the Managing Director of Matrix Partners India. As an investor, Vikram is all about building the India of tomorrow. He says his areas of passion include payments, fintech, edtech, and SaaS. I am told that stands for software as a service and not just SaaS. Uh, Vikram, please take the stage and enlighten us all on the state of fintech in India. Ladies and gentlemen, Vikram Vedinathan. Hi everyone, uh, super excited to be here. Um, my name is Vikram. I'm a managing director at Matrix India. I've been an early stage investor for the last uh, 13 plus years, leading early investments. Um, about nine years ago, I met uh, two friends who had given up very uh, high paying jobs to start a fintech payments company. They're of course Harshil and Shashank and uh, we were uh, privileged to invest in their first round. And it's a proud moment for me to now be here uh, so many years after and see them hosting an event of this scale to have built a platform like this. Uh, so congrats to uh, Harshil Shashang and the Razorpay team uh, and thanks for having me. We're also investors across the financial services fintech ecosystem uh, on, in public companies like Five Star and companies like Off Business, Oxizo, uh, Jupiter, OneCard, a lot of the founders are in the audience today. Hello to them and I know they're speaking uh, a little bit later. So when uh, they asked me to speak about sort of the state of fintech and describe sort of where we are as an ecosystem. I thought, let me set some context and let me also go back and say, hey, what can we learn from how these things have evolved? And one of the things I realized is that there's no overnight success in the financial services ecosystem. It takes very long and then it just continues to build and compound even with that large scale. So, I put together some of these names which are quite old, you know, from the 1950s onwards. Um, and if I take, let's just take Visa, which um, grew 250 billion in value in 10 years, 2008 to 2018, and pretty much added that exact same amount in five years, 2018 to 2023. Same thing, if I look at closer to home, HDFC Bank added 70 billion in that first 10 year period, added 80 billion or so, or, or more in a five-year period. So first 10 years takes time, and then the next five years is much shorter and even larger. So how are we doing as an ecosystem? It's been about 10 years as an ecosystem, and that ecosystem has created about 100 billion in value, and all of those names are recognizable. Um, and you know valuations go up and down through different times, but that's sizable value that's been created in a 10-year period. And then you know, if you fast forward, and there are a bunch of companies on the right that are an inspiration for all of us, that's taken 30 to 50 years. So when I take this 10 years and the chart that I just had before, which is, if I look at the next five years, I would venture that this 100 billion is gonna grow very fast. I don't know if they get to 100 billion in five years, but it's a very large number. And so we're very excited about that. Now people ask me, hey, isn't this like growth tapped out? Um, which categories is this going to happen in? It turns out, all of them. Because in India, we're still underserved. Most users either get one or access to one or two financial services, but even the users that deserve financial services, which means that they have enough money and they should get access to financial services, are not served well. And that's true in every category. I put up credit cards as a, as a way of showing consumer credit. I've put in private credit, which is uh, SME. Almost everywhere, we are nowhere near a global benchmark. And so when India goes through this next period of a big boom and becomes the third largest economy, we should see category growth in every one of those categories. And if you look at those category growths on the, on, on, the, on the right there, you'll see that those categories are growing at two to three X that of GDP. And usually the category leader is growing two to five X that. So which means that the category leaders in this room will grow anywhere between 50 to 60% to 100% YOY, and that's the room for growth in every one of these categories. The interesting thing about India is that all of this is tech-led. And I don't think anyone in this, uh, would be here in this room today if it was, wasn't for the India stack and the digital public infrastructure that's been built, almost we, we use it every day, we build on top of it on an everyday basis. As that stack 
is adopted and people build on top of the stack in each category, you can see what happens in each category. And you suddenly, there is just increasing penetration of those categories. And you know, we've just tried to highlight what uh, the adoption of the India stack or the penetration of the India stack is in each of these categories. So as you go more, more and more toward, towards uh, my left there, you can see that there is still so much room for work for fintech entrepreneurs in this room to build on top of the stack and drive adoption and penetration of financial services. Some of this should be showing up already today. It is. If you look at the last three years of growth, and payments has just been explosive, and so I'm, I haven't put that up. But if you look at every other category in financial services products, every other category has actually grown more than 2x. Right? So you have consumer credit, you have uh, mutual funds, you have insurance. Every category has, has grown more than 2x. So everything's hunky-dory, everything's all good. So what's the problem? And the problem is that the regulator is worried that all of this growth has come at the expense of risk and compliance being built into the ecosystem. And so there are speed bumps everywhere. And rightly so, the regulator is putting, putting speed bumps everywhere to slow the ecosystem down so that we can build in the right way. Often, people see all of this and they say, hey, you're a fintech investor. Isn't fintech dead? And I will say, this statement I will add, after fintech is dead, is long live fintech. For those who don't get that reference, usually when the queen or king dies, you say, the queen is dead, long live the queen. And because there is a new, stronger queen emerging and willing to take the institution forward. And for me, that's where we are, which is we are building the right systems such that fintech can emerge stronger and build enduring companies out of this ecosystem. What do we need to do in order to be able to do that? The first is to embrace regulation as a feature, not a bug. And when we did this report, uh, we do this annual report every year alongside BCG. We did this at the end of last year. And we asked them, why is regulation needed? What are your pain points? And this is fintech practitioners, incumbents, regulators, everyone answering the survey. More than 50% agreed that the need of the R is more regulation, both to safeguard the risk as well as to drive innovation forward. And the pain point is, hey, we don't know if this is really clear. We want consistency in, in all of this. So as a fintech practitioner, how do you deal with this? What do you do? The first advice I have for you is get a seat at the table, or you're going to be on the menu and you're going to be lunch. What does that mean? It means go have conversations early. You'll be surprised how open the regulator is or your bank partner is to having this conversation early. And just by having this conversation, and I also encourage you to put, put that down in writing, you will know what is coming down the pipe. And then you will make the right choices because you know what curveball is coming around the, around the corner. The second is to do the right thing, because most of the time you know that this needs to be done. And while doing the right thing, not just to the letter of the law, but also with the right intent, tell people that you're doing this. And the more you tell people, and especially with the regulators and so on, they will give you more time, because they can see that you're trying to do the right thing. And the last is for you know, for the people who have sort of lived through many crises like, like I have, I've lived through the gold loan crisis, the, the microfinance crisis, the ILFS crisis, some of those were because uh, of some regulations, some of those were because risk built up in the system. But in each of those crises, there was a complete change in the pecking order in that particular market. For the people who expected it and were waiting for it, they moved from number five to number one or number 10 to number four, and so everything changed. So if you have the right mindset and you're actually expecting some of these safeguards to come, this is an in incredible opportunity for you to gain market share in, in your particular category. So that's one on regulation. Second is on operating models and business models. So everybody keeps asking me, what is the right operating business model? When do these companies make money? What is happening? And we tried to distill from some of the biggest leaders and some companies that we have invested in, there are many ways of building a fintech company that can endure over a period of time. The first is platform plays. Right? And we are 
uh, at Razor Pay, and it's probably one of the best examples of a platform pay, play. But what do they do? In the initial days, there is an equation of low CAC, low customer acquisition cost, and high financial trust. So you have enormous pull. Lots of people want to, want to use something that you've built, and you use that to gain high financial trust, but you don't make a lot of money. You just get the trust. But at that point of building that trust, you can't spend a lot of money. You have to do it at low customer acquisition costs. Once you gain someone's trust, and they trust you with their money and their monetary decisions, suddenly you can sell them lots and lots of products. And we saw a product, multiple product launches today. The reason Razorpay is able to do all of that is because they have your trust. That's platform plays, and there, you know, there are others, Zerodha, Grow, or PhonePay, a lot of them are all platform companies. But they started with that low CAC, high financial trust equation. The second is a set of companies which are a little bit more traditional. They use offline touch points to build that trust. Offline touch points are expensive. So then they capture a higher transaction at the beginning, and that higher transaction has more profit, but more risk. They manage that risk, and then they compound in a more linear way over a period of time. But even those companies can become very large. We're excited about them. I'll talk a little bit about how digital is reshaping those companies. The third is a newer set of companies. And we're seeing them target digitally native set of users in a very focused manner. And they are getting to 1 to 5 million users, getting very sticky engagement through different ways. Sometimes it's, it's payments, sometimes it's savings, sometimes it's bill payments, and so on. And then driving cross-sell. And people often ask me, is that a viable model? When I look at some of the largest banks that we respect, AU Bank has about 5 million, 5 million accounts. IDFC Bank has thereabouts, maybe a little bit more. So if you look at some of the largest companies that have been created in a more traditional universe in, in, the, in the last decade, those all have about 5 million accounts. And so you can get to that base of users, and as long as they give you very high wallet share, you can actually build a larger company. This is yet to be proven out. We're investors in a bunch of them, like OneCart and Jupiter and so on. So that's the learning on operating and business models. Now, if you look at trend lines, and I wanted to end with things that we are excited about, because people ask me, hey, fintech investor, what are you investing in? And I think this is probably the most exciting phase where we continue to have very large companies coming out of it. And it is, before, it used to be one idea that can work at that period of time. But now, it is actually 10 ideas that can work just because of how large the ecosystem is and how ubiquitous it is. Uh, so the first trend line is vertical fintechs. So we have multiple supply chains which are adopting digital. Right? It could be, uh, it could be more traditional steel supply chains. It could be the, the grocery supply chains. Every supply chain is digitizing. In that digitization, you always have payments opportunities. That payments opportunity usually leads to a financing opportunity. Then that leads to an opportunity which combines fintech and commerce. And that's the kind of things that we are looking at there. The second is a set of opportunities in digital lending, which is we just saw there's a credit gap everywhere. And so you will have lending companies that are getting created. The interesting thing for us is that each of these lending companies and each of the founders is adopting the right tech for their business. Sometimes it is in the sourcing end of things. Sometimes it's in the underwriting end of things. Sometimes it's only in the collections end of things. But we are seeing each one of them is forming a puzzle which is actually working for them. That's the thing that we're uh, interested in. Fintech infra, um, the transaction part of the fintech infra stack is obviously very well uh, built out. It's the envy of the world, and the world wants to adopt our transaction stack. But the rest of the stack that this the transaction stack interacts with is legacy. So it was never built for this kind of concurrency with so many transactions hitting the, uh, hitting the, the older stack. And therefore, that entire older stack needs to turn over very, very quickly. And that leads to a whole set of opportunities and so on. Right? Um, whether it's insurance, whether it's banking, almost every single person, uh, every single buyer or incumbent is looking for a new version of their, of their stack. Payments rail innovation going to continue. We have credit on UPI, cross-border payments, vertical payments opportunities, everything that we are looking at. This debt securitization and the, um, the overall debt framework of the country has been a, something that's a uh, pet thesis of mine forever, and it seems like the time for that has finally come. Because as an ecosystem, you can't keep borrowing from the banks. 
the regulator is telling you, and it just it taps out. So you need sophisticated debt instruments in which, as investors, you can invest in, and as fintechs, you can borrow from. And all of that, uh, all of that framework is now coming into place. SEBI has actually made a bu bunch of uh, 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 different changes along with the RBI, and this is coming together. I'm pretty excited to figure out how a lot of founders in the room will figure out what is the company. Do I manufacture products? Do I distribute them? Do, am I a marketplace? It's, it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see what companies come out of it. In short tech, I think it's heading for a UPI moment. I spent some time at the IDA uh, recently, and you know what's happening in the sandbox reminds me of what used to be happening uh, 10 years ago, to th call it around 2013, when you know the India stack was getting built. And the excitement there lead me to believe we're sort of somewhere in that zone where we could have a UPI movement for insurance and multiple companies coming out of there. So uh, that's us. I'm just going to plug in some of my uh, friends in the room who helped me put together the, this deck. You can check us out on Matrix Moments. We continue to be excited about the fintech uh, space. So closing comments. We're in the middle journey for the fintech ecosystem. These, the, the ecosystem has proven that we belong and we cater to a very large base. And if we build capabilities that compound in the long term, I think we are going to see 100-year companies come out of this ecosystem. And at least for us, uh, that's the call that we are making on the ecosystem. Regulation today is front and center in every conversation. Build that into your cost, not just monetary but also the pace of your company is going to be de defined by the compliance and regulation that, that, you, that you adopt. So at least for us, the best is yet to come. Thank you for uh, your time and uh, look forward to the rest of the day. Uh, I'm going to end with, uh, again, saying how inspiring it is to see all of you and for a company that we've invested in to be hosting something like this. Thank you.